Good morning and welcome to our service of Sunday praise on this Palm Sunday. And congratulations if you're managing to watch us live and have remembered to put your clocks forward. And if you're watching it an hour later, not realizing that the clocks went forward, well, my commiserations, hopefully the service will have been properly uploaded by the time you find us. Our service this morning, I'm leading. Uh, Karen Laycock will be preaching on uh, Luke's gospel, but we're leaping forward now to the story of Jesus's entry to Jerusalem in preparation for Good Friday and Easter Day. Sarah Margetts will be leading our family slot and Matt and Naomi Green will be, will be involved. Uh, Matt and Ruth will be leading our worship in church and Naomi is going to be teaching us the creed. Well, I'm sure that many of us are really looking forward to tomorrow and the relaxation of some of the rules of lockdown. We can meet with up to six people in a garden or two households and we don't have to stay at home all the time. And as we celebrate that newfound freedom, we remember the cost, uh, human cost of COVID and lockdown that we've been through. And as we prepare to celebrate Easter, we need to remember the cost that Jesus paid. On Palm Sunday, we remember how he entered Jerusalem with a great shout of excitement from the crowd, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But he rode into Jerusalem to die before he could rise and give us freedom, freedom from the fear of death and from the power of sin. Now, if you haven't got a palm cross, some people I know got them in the post, there are plenty in church if you want to pop in and collect one, or maybe you've got an old one or you've made a cross. But the palm cross reminds us each year at home of what is the center of Christian faith. So I'm gonna say a prayer that blesses these crosses and reminds us of the heart of our faith. O oh God, our Father, your Son, Jesus Christ, entered Jerusalem as Messiah to suffer and to die. Let these crosses be for us signs of his victory and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our King and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life. For he lives and reigns with you, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now we're going to watch uh, uh, Naomi Greenwood on video teaching us uh, the Apostles' Creed. And she's doing it with a British Sign Language. And hopefully next Sunday we're going to learn a few phrases of British Sign Language as we remember that Jesus died and rose again. But for today, let's listen and say the words along with her. And if you know the actions, please join in. So name is going to lead us in the Apostles' Creed, and then Matt and Ruth will take us into our first song. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Cries from Palm Sunday, Hosanna, praise is rising. Praise is rising, eyes are turning to you.
Good morning. Who here is excited for Easter? Me too. Now, the story of Easter takes place at a special time for the Jewish people. When they gather in Jerusalem, the city where their temple was, to celebrate how God protected them many years ago when they were in Egypt and how he saved them. They have a special celebration called the Passover every year to remember what God did for them and how he rescued them. Now, one year, as the people came to Jerusalem to celebrate and remember, they became really excited because Jesus was coming and he'd been doing amazing things among them. Jesus was a Jew, so he was going to celebrate the Passover with his people in Jerusalem. And that's when this story takes place. Now, in a moment, I'm going to read you the story from Mark chapter 11. However, this story is so important. It's in the Bible four times. That's right, it's in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. They all tell the same story about how Jesus entered Jerusalem and what happened and how all the people were very excited to see him. So, go away, grab your Bibles and find Mark chapter 11. Have you found it? Brilliant. It goes like this. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, this is Jesus and his disciples, to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into that village in front of you and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt. Now, a colt is the name for a baby donkey. Tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it to me. Um, and if anyone says to you, uh, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it and will send it back immediately. And they went away and they found a colt tied at a door in the street and they untied it. And some of those standing there said, um, what are you doing untying that colt? And they told them what Jesus had said and they let them go. Now, this is an aside. The Jews had been told many years ago before to look out for your king. He is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey, on the colt, the foal of a donkey. The Jewish people who were waiting and gathering in Jerusalem knew this and they were watching. So when Jesus came on a donkey, they became very excited because that's what they've been waiting for. They've been waiting for their king to come in riding on a donkey. Okay, back to the story. And then the disciples brought the colt to Jesus and they threw their cloaks on its back and he sat on it, on the donkey that no one had ever ridden. And they spread their coats on the road and others spread leafy branches that they'd found on the fields. Now, this is a little bit like you would do for a king or a famous person. You know, when you roll out a red carpet and you prepare a special thing for them to walk on. It's a little bit like that. They, thought they knew Jesus was special, so they put out a special thing for the donkey to walk on. And those that went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Okay, now Hosanna sort of means hooray! Hooray for King Jesus! King Jesus is going to save us. They're expecting Jesus to be their king. Can you shout Hosanna? One, two, three, Hosanna! Okay, did anyone else shout? Can you shout with me this time? One, two, three, Hosanna! Okay, last time we're gonna try Hosanna in the highest. 
One, two, three. Hosanna in the highest! Whoa, good shouting. Okay. And then, as Jesus entered Jerusalem, he went to the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already getting late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve disciples. Wow, great story. Now, let's see what you can remember, because quite a lot happened in this story. Now, what did Jesus walk on? Walk on? Ride on? What did Jesus ride on? That's right, Jesus rode on a donkey, on a colt, a baby donkey. Well done. Next question. What did the crowds spread on the road for Jesus to walk on? What did they spread? There's a couple of things that they spread on the road. They spread on the road their cloaks, their coats. They took their coats off, put them on the road so the donkey could walk on them. And they put leaves, branches on the road from the palm trees in the fields so that Jesus could walk on those as well. So if you, well done if you said either of those things. And what did they shout? Now, we shouted a few minutes ago, didn't we? What did they shout? That's right, they shouted, Hosanna! Like we did. Okay, and then the next question is a little bit harder. And it's, why do you think that Jesus rode on a donkey and not a horse? Most people ride on horses, not donkeys. Now, Jesus rode on a donkey to show that he was humble. This sort of means that he didn't go around showing everyone that he was important. Quite often an important people go on horses and the horses trot quite haughtily. But donkeys, donkeys are, are humble creatures. That's why Jesus rode on a donkey, to show that he was humble. And as we already said, to show that he was the king that the Jews were waiting for. Remember that they had been told a long time ago that their king was going to come gentle and riding on a baby donkey. So they were really excited when they saw Jesus coming riding on the baby donkey. Okay, let's pray. Father God, just like the Jewish people, we celebrate all that you did for us in the past and we praise you for being our king and for saving us. Amen. I am a sinner on hell. I am a light in the darkness. Jesus living in me can change the world. If 
God is for me, who can stand against me? Let my light shine, let my light shine, let my light shine. If God is for me, who can stand against me? Let my light shine, let my light shine, let my light shine. We are a city on a hill, we are a light in the darkness. Jesus living in us can change the world. We are a city on a hill, we are a light in the darkness. Jesus living in us can change the world. Let your light shine, let your light shine, let your light shine. Let it shine, let your light shine, let your light shine, let your light shine. If God is for us, who can stand against us? Let your light shine, let your light shine, let your light shine. Let it shine, if God is for us, who can stand against us? Let your light shine, let your light shine, let your light shine. Good morning. I'm here interviewing Tony and Anne Sammons. And my first question for you, Tony and Anne, is how are you? <laughs> you can answer. Well, the short answer is we're fine. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> That's good to hear. <laughs> Um, no, we we are. I mean, you know, at our age, you don't expect to have everything working perfectly, but um, we are, compared with a lot of other people, we are absolutely fine. Yeah. And um, we've had our first jab and we're having our second one in two weeks. Fantastic news. Uh, my next question for you is, can you think of any particular blessings you've experienced during this time of staying safe at home? I think one of the things that the lockdowns have shown us, or me, is um, how busy our lives have been and whether that busyness was necessary. Because being retired, we haven't many worries. And a lot of the things we were doing, we don't have to do. So I think it's made, made me think a bit more about what, what, what we can do with our daily lives. It's certainly nice having more time. Yeah. Getting a bit more balance. That's right. Mm. Yes. Well, I, um, I, would, I think I would have to say that our biggest blessing is that um, on April, last year, on April the, I think it was the oh, 9th, um, just before Easter, Sarah moved here yes. um, from Bristol. Well, she'd been actually, she'd been in Exeter, but she had come down from Bristol a year before that. And um, she always said she would when she retired, but we never sort of thought it would really happen. And it's just lovely having her in Bubby. And she's been, a, she has been a real blessing to us um, since we went into lockdown. I'm pleased to say that we're in a bubble and uh, it's a happy bubble <laughs> so yes, no that's that's been great and um i think to a blessing actually i really feel this that we've done it with two of us it, yeah. we've been together yes. and we are, i have several friends who are single ladies now and it's a very different cup of tea so we are very yes. very thankful for that I don't want to do all the talking, <laughs> <laughs> but we live in a lovely place and the walks here are great. Um, we find the people in Bavi are very friendly. Um, we do miss our, the people, the friends that we've made at church. Mm. And I really miss seeing a lot of the families and especially the little ones. Yeah. I mean, I hardly recognised York. Um, Bella, when we saw her last week, she she's shot up, hasn't she? Yeah, <laughs> I think we're uh, going to find that when we all do finally come back to church, yes. all the children yes. are going to have changed so much. 
Yes. Uh, and that's one thing we missed. We haven't seen, well, we've got Zoom, of course, but it's not the same thing. So we haven't seen the grandchildren and that sort of thing. Of course. No, no, we've had two of, our, two of our, two of Ju Julia's children um, have been at Exeter University for a couple know. of years and we haven't seen any, either of them since um, we first went into lockdown. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's been a bit sad. Um, we, and we have missed seeing the Oxford family. We've seen a bit more of the Exeter one, mm -hmm. but um, we shall look forward to that. Lovely. My last question for you is, what are you most looking forward to as the lockdown restrictions start to ease? Well, getting my hair cut. <laughs> 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 Definitely. Mm. Uh, um, well, I should be getting yeah. back on the golf course. I have missed my golf. <laughs> I bet. So it's, and it's, it's meeting people generally. I mean, I haven't been into many shops during lockdown because Anne's been doing the shopping but uh, it's just being with people I suppose mm. yeah yes and we we have missed having friends to the house and um, sharing meals with people and that sort of thing um, mm. and and well as I said before the family we've really missed I just want to give them a hug yeah <laughs> yeah and um, I, we really have missed that. We can hug each other. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think we did, the, we have missed our church friends. We really yes. have. And being together and worshipping together. Yes. Um, but we have really appreciated the fact that we just about managed to do this kind of thing, Zoom. Um, and we've um, sadly we've had three family funerals, but we managed to feel that we were there because mm. they were live streamed, which was good. Yeah. Um, and we've we've used our iPads a lot, mm. and that's been a blessing. And mm. but it will be so good when we can actually join up and meet people yeah. in person. Look them yeah. eye to eye. <laughs> That's right. I'm feeling really thankful for technology, but it will be so wonderful when we don't yeah. have to rely on it so much. Yes, right. yes, yes, it will. It'll be lovely. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, it's been so lovely catching up with you guys. And uh, I, for one, can't wait to see you back in church sometime soon. Thanks for taking the time to chat to me. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye. Well, good morning. Um, thank you, Rosie. Um, for the interview. Um, we're now going to say our prayers for Palm Sunday, so let us pray. And we start with the collect for Palm Sunday. Almighty and everlasting God, who in your tender love towards the human race sent your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, to take upon flesh and to suffer death upon a cross, grant that we may follow the example of his patience and humility and also be made partakers of his resurrection through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for the gift of life that we have with the Lord Jesus. We thank you that we can rely on your faithfulness, love and mercy to us as sinners, particularly on Palm Sunday, we remember the triumphant walk into Jerusalem that Jesus made riding on a donkey and then to be hung on a cross to die for our sins. O oh Lord Jesus, you knew that riding into the holy city amidst, uh, amidst the pomp and circumstance, what you would have to face in the coming days. Lord, how many of us wouldn't have continued if we knew the worst possible ending was inevitable. But Lord Jesus, you continued on to accomplish the will of God in peace and not panic. You passionately cry tears of blood, asking there be any other way, and then obediently and peacefully walked to the cross because it was the only way. Thank you, Lord God, that we can walk through trouble, trial and pain because our Saviour sustains us. Jesus, you have already walked the most difficult path and died to defeat the death we deserve. 
All of the pain we experience on earth is temporary. But those who embrace Jesus as Saviour will be eternally with him in heaven. No pain, no suffering, no sickness and no death. We can only look at the empty cross and wait in faith and hope for our Lord's return with joy and peace in our hearts. For there is a crown of life waiting for us in heaven for those of who believe in the power and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to build hope in these times of gross uncertainty, the very real fallen state of our world and frailty of life that have put front and centre in our lives in a visceral way. We look to you, Father, to guide us out of the fear and remind us of our Saviour. We thank you, Lord, that we do not need to be afraid. We have given, you have given us wisdom. We need to live each day of our lives to the full purpose you have designed us to live. Help us to see beyond the fear and spread, uh, help us to see beyond the fear spread by man in its many forms and to keep our eyes fixed on the pathway that you have designed for us. We pray for the world in which we live, this wonderful, beautiful world which you created, Lord. We see the delights of the radiant flowers and trees and new life growing. We are blessed to live in such beautiful surroundings. However, there are parts of the world, Lord, that have not been so blessed. We pray for peace and monetary support for the people in Yemen. Lord, bring an end to the suffering that these poor people are going through. We ask, Lord, for the problems with the ever-given container ship is causing in the Suez Canal to come to an end swiftly. Give the salvage team all the things they need to free the ship. Let us remember also the situation between the Philippines and China. Lord, bring peace and calm to the rising tensions in the region between these two countries. And Father, we remember and pray for all Christians who are being persecuted around the world for their faith in you. Build and protect them so they may carry on your work. And we ask, Lord, that you give us wisdom and foresight to our government during this time. Help them to make the correct decisions for the country. We pray for guidance too for our, our, our own Minister Graham. Give him spiritual knowledge to bring us your word. And we pray for Mark and Eleanor who will be going forward for clerical training later this year. Prepare their hearts and minds for all that they will be learning about you. Lord, we bring our church before you and ask for help with all the Easter preparations that will be going ahead next week. We pray for those who are ill at this time. Bring healing to those who we know who are ill or infirmed and those on our church notice sheet. And I will pause a few minutes for you to name the person close to your heart that needs healing or peace in their lives. Let us rejoice and be glad knowing that Jesus will return soon and take us home. Let us revel in your love and care and may we tell the world of your great love for all of us, Lord. Use us as witnesses to bring others to the knowledge and saving power of Christ. And we will now say the Lord's Prayer together, which should be on the screen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Good morning. I almost feel I want to apologise because I'm going to be reading about the triumphal entry too. But this one is taken from Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, 28 to 44. And I was surprised to find some things here that I had not remembered, so perhaps you will too. And when Jesus had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. 
when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as they had been told. Oh, I think we had that bit, sorry. And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Lovely to be with you. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Amen. What usually comes to mind when we think about Palm Sunday? I always think it's a special day of celebration and marks the beginning of Holy Week. It often involves a procession, although sadly not this year or even last year for obvious reasons. We at PPT have often met in the church rooms and then processed joyfully up to the church, waving our newly acquired palm crosses and shouting, Hosanna! Over the years, we've even met in town and processed up East Street following a donkey once again in a joyful procession, sometimes singing well-known hymns as we walked to the church. Things like, all glory, Lord, and honour to thee, Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children made sweet hosannas ring. Thou art the King of Israel, thou David's royal son, who in the Lord's name cometh, the King and Blessed One. We celebrate the arrival of a king, King Jesus, who has come to claim his rightful place. He seems to have fulfilled his destiny and can take his throne. But has he? Is this the celebration we perceive it to be? As Sarah said in the children's talk, the story of the triumphal entry is a really important, significant event and can be found in all four Gospels. But each one emphasises slightly different aspects of the story. 
Jerusalem has always been Jesus's destiny. Ever since the transfiguration, Jesus has been speaking to his disciples about going up to Jerusalem. He's even warned his disciples that he would be going there to die. Jesus and his disciples and many other Jewish people were traveling up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, the great spring festival at the heart of Jewish life. This is still really important to Jewish people from this day, from that day to this. The roads of the city would have been bustling with hundreds of excited pilgrims in holiday mood as they traveled up to the city and then processed joyfully up to the temple singing psalms of joy. You only have to think about all the traffic nose to tail on the A38 or the A30 at the beginning of the spring bank holiday as people travel down to Cornwall for the run for the sun and the summer surfing to imagine the scene. The story is full of symbolism, but would that have been picked up by the people of the time? It unfolds with several important, it's significant points. Number one, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of a borrowed donkey. As Jesus continued his journey, he paused on the Mount of Olives to give his disciples precise instructions as to how to procure the mount. It wasn't a long walk into the city. And also, it is the very first time that we hear Jesus has ridden on an animal. So why? Did he suddenly ride into the city? Was something important about to happen? I think we can conclude that this was a conscious and deliberate act and not an accidental one. It was also an important fulfillment of prophecy. If we look back to Zechariah chapter nine, the prophecy reminds us of the combined identity of the future king and messiah as both victorious and humble. Zechariah says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. If we read a bit further into Zechariah, in chapter 14, Zechariah prophesies about when the day of the Lord will come and how he is to reign. He says, on that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives, which lies before Jerusalem to the east. So the gospel writer then goes on in detail about how the animal was to be obtained. Jesus didn't go himself, but he sent two of his disciples to them saying, go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you'll find a cult tying there, which no one has ever ridden untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why you're untying it, say the Lord needs it. Was this event prearranged or was it miraculous? Jesus knew exactly where the animal would be. He knew how the owners would respond to the disciples taking their young animal. And yet we've no indication that Jesus had ever been to the village before or met the owners. Imagine how you'd feel if two people came and borrowed your car and just said, the Lord needs it. Would you let it go to strangers? Jesus also knew how the animal, which had never been ridden, would cope with a grown man riding it through crowds as they approached the city. When we think about the training that a police horse has to go to before it's fit to go on the streets, or an unbroken horse or donkey, needs to be broken in before it's fit to be ridden. It almost sounds like a miracle. By Jesus acting in this way was a statement of his authority. 
He is the creator and therefore has a right to man's possessions. He doesn't deal with the issue directly, but through his disciples, who were sent by Jesus in his authority. And finally, the animal seems completely calm when Jesus, with Jesus, and copes amazingly with him riding into the city. This shows that Jesus has power over the animal kingdom as well as humans. The second point, was it a triumphant entry or an untriumphant one? On that day, Jesus was the same person that he had been all the way through his ministry. So what was it that made the crowds begin to recognize and proclaim him as Messiah? Was the donkey on the Mount of Olives enough? We read that the disciples threw their cloaks on the donkey for Jesus to sit on. And the crowd spread their cloaks on the road. Those who knew their scriptures might well have remembered that when one of Israel's king, King Jehu, was anointed with oil and proclaimed king in defiance of the existing one, his followers spread their cloaks under his feet and hailed him as king. This can be found in 2 Kings chapter 9. The people seemed to be determined to make a statement about what they thought was going on. They began to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles that they had seen. And as they praised, they quoted Psalm 118. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. There seemed to be a great crowd involved in the entry, disciples and pilgrims who come for the celebrations, swept along by the happy carnival atmosphere. But I'm not sure that everyone really understood the meaning and the significance of what they were doing by welcoming Jesus to Jerusalem. Even some of the disciples regarded Jesus' entry as the entry of the Messiah, Israel's conquering king, a deliverer, someone who would lead them in a revolt against Rome. But they didn't understand when his kingdom would be instituted or how. We read that the Pharisees in the crowd wanted Jesus to rebuke his disciples. They realized the danger that the mob mentality could be. But Jesus replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. It must have provided an impetus for the Jewish religious leaders to act quickly and decisively to get rid of Jesus. He must be stopped and stopped quickly. As Jesus arrived in Jerusalem, the crowds melted away. Human attention span is very poor. Today we blame it on uh, the, the uh, pace of life, on technology, mobile phones and the power of social media. But it was ever thus. As the crowds arrived in Jerusalem after their journey, they were probably tired and just anxious to find accommodation and something to eat. None of the Gospels give an explanation about why the crowds disappeared. For us today, even when we face the most important news of all, it's all too easy to be distracted and for our attention span to fade. It is important for us to reflect on this regarding our own Christian lives. We need to keep on reading, listening and praying to maintain our own Christian beliefs. We also need to keep speaking, proclaiming and acting and not become disillusioned when we try to help others grasp the Christian, Christian message. It's also important to be aware that actions rich in meaning like Jesus riding on a donkey to the Mount of Olives, can speak far more loudly than words. Perhaps we need to pay as much attention 
to what we do and how we do it as to what we say. And my third point is Jesus's response to his reception. You would imagine that Jesus would be pleased with his rapturous reception, but as he approached the city, he wept over it. Luke ends the story of the great journey with Jesus's lament over Jerusalem. As he takes his first view of the city, he foresees what is going to happen to the city in the future. A pretty grim end. In AD 66, 40 years after Jesus's prediction, the Jews revolted against Rome. And after three years, the rebellion was put down. The Roman soldiers attacked Jerusalem, but didn't capture it until AD 70. And then just as Jesus warned, the enemies will encircle you the people and their children killed, the nation's capital, a royal city, a smoking, desolate ruin. And this is the same city which Jesus' ardent supporters had expected him to mount the throne. The people had failed to understand the kingship of Jesus. He is the king who comes in the name of the Lord and would bring them peace. They seem blind and fail to grasp that peace isn't accomplished by sword and force. Men suppose that the kingdom will be found on acts of power and might and by more miracles, but Jesus was intent on fulfilling the will of the Father. He turns our attention from political transformation of society to spiritual transformation of the soul. He is to bring about the kingdom by personal pain, rejection and suffering, being obedient to death, even on a cross. This is the way of the cross. Jesus is king, but the earthly Jerusalem is too small. He is about to be rejected by his own people, and handed over to the Gentiles, persecuted, abused, and crucified. But all nations are to be his. And as we read in Philippians, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. So to sum up, the story of the triumphal entry is one of contrasts. It's the story of a king who came as a lowly servant on a donkey, not a prancing steed. He wasn't in royal, royal robes, but on the clothes of the poor and humble. Jesus Christ comes not to conquer by force as earthly kings, but by love, grace, mercy, and his own sacrifice for his people. His is not a kingdom of armies and splendor, but of lowliness and servanthood. He conquers not nations, but hearts and minds. His message is one of peace with God, not of temporal peace. And it is for everyone. As it says in the Great Commission at the end of Matthew's Gospel, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is our role to be salt and light, 
He is the example of what Christians should be and spread the, the word and the good news of God's kingdom. So let us hope that next year we can go out and spread the word of God and really celebrate that Christ is our Lord and King triumphant. Amen. And we're going to sing our final song, which is Make Way. Let's make way for the kingdom of God and for the King. Well, thank you to everyone who's been a part of our service today, either leading the music or speaking. Uh, just a few notices to draw to your attention before we close. Please do either pick up a physical copy of uh, the uh, Palm Sunday leaflet or download the one from the, in, from the website or in the weekly email. Uh, there is a reminder in the notice sheet that uh, we are trying to raise funds for Tom and Christine Harrison, who are serving at the moment uh, with YWAM in Canada and are planning to return in the summer. And uh, they do need our help as they prepare for a rather expensive process coming back. So please do uh, consider them uh, in your prayers this week. Uh, today's Palm Sunday and next Sunday is Easter Sunday. And uh, we're hoping to have, uh, we're planning to have a service outside at 9.30 when we're going to sing aloud. And then at 11 o'clock we'll be having a communion service in church. And we may go outside and sing at the end of that one as well. 
and the, the weather forecast looks reasonable, so do plan to come along. It's really important you book. We've got 60 people booked for the outside service already, and about 30 for the inside, and there will be a limit, and I'm going to advertise it to the town tomorrow, so uh, don't miss out. Put your booking in. We're going to be decorating the church after uh, Lent being bare and plain. So if you want to come and decorate the church on Saturday, um, Sarah Gilbert will be coordinating that and bring flowers and make the church look beautiful and fresh. But Easter isn't here yet. This is Holy Week. And we don't want to go straight from the joy of Palm Sunday to the joy of Easter without first remembering the way of the cross. And even if you haven't managed to do perhaps everything you thought you'd do uh, during Lent, perhaps that Lent book hasn't quite been read as you thought you might, do make time this week to read again a gospel, the passion story, Luke chapter 22 and 23. We'll be reading it each day uh, at morning prayer. And there's a series of services through the week at which you'd be very welcome. There'll be communion on Wednesday morning, Communion again on Thursday evening for Monday Thursday, and on Friday afternoon, Carolyn and Eleanor will be leading a service of quiet prayer, readings, and music so that we can reflect on what the cross means. And even if you can't come to church, you don't feel ready to do that, why not put a cross in your window or in the front of your garden so the rest of the world does not forget the reason for this season, that our hope is in Christ crucified. That is the victory we celebrate. So as we close, let's pray. Almighty God, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer for us on the cross once for all. Help us not to be ashamed of his cross and the gospel news which it means. Help us to take up our cross and to suffer with him so that we may share in his glory and share in his joy. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning.